Hello, I'm Eric Heim Klein, and I want to welcome you to our virtual booth at the Arliss Fair this year. This is the first time that we've tried something like this. Normally, virtual booths are very static, and we would end up showing pictures of individual books with descriptions. But in conversation with my staff, we thought that it might be really interesting to try to do something a little bit more live, a little bit more animated. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. In a moment, I'm going to take you back into a booth that we fit, set up that's different than the ones I normally do at Arliss itself because there you remember we have these long tables and I show books to you individually as you come by. In this case we're going to have them on racks and you'll see in a moment what type of stuff we're showing. So the space that, that we inhabit here in Los Angeles is 15,000 square feet. It's uh, full of books. It's, there's a quarter of a million books here. I wish they were all of the same quality as the books that I'm going to show, show to you, but unfortunately they're not. But they're of all different types. We used to have a general bookstore, and as we've evolved over time and with the internet and everything else, we focus really on the areas that are, frankly, of particular interest to me. And high in those are things like architecture, photography, the decorative arts, and the plastic arts. And it's always a pleasure to like, go around the world looking for that type of material. And recently I actually had the great privilege of buying a small collection of Bauhaus and German modernism, which is what I'm going to be featuring primarily for you today. In any event, it's, uh, I'm very happy that, that, that you're here, that you took the time to click through to see our booth. And I want to actually say, please, come with me and I'm going to show you the books. So we repurposed a little bit of a space that normally the staff would have lunch in, or if customers came to visit, it's a nice setting. There's a couch and a table, and we set up the racks to show the booth here for you. So this is a small selection from our inventory that uh, features types of topics and individual works that uh, attract me, that I find great, of great interest, and uh, that are, in this case, mostly visual or decorative. Uh, so let's let's start over on this side. For example, just in terms of the shelves, we have uh, pochoir plates of ceramics. We have works on color theory, which we're going to come back and mention more specifically later. A little bit of photography and lighting, and then here we've got photography from Ringer Potch and and uh, Herbert Byers, Wunder des Lebens, modernism and, and design, Moholy. Bauhaus, again, modernism, Bauhaus, two portfolios. This is an example of decorative ironwork, Art Nouveau, and Seguis, Pochoirs, and then Bauhaus material in the center. And over here we have Peter Behrens and Expressionist art books, decorative arts, uh, interiors from boutiques, the famous uh, International Theater House Journal. Uh, Helmar Lersky, I thought would be interesting to see as a photography work. And then over here we have a, two entirely contrasting pieces of photography at the top. We have portraiture done under the WPA of Pueblo Indians, next to Eric Mendelssohn's classic monograph on American architecture. Works of caricature on this shelf from the Spanish Civil War, anti-Nazi material in Holland and in Czechoslovakia. Decorative, uh, expressive dance, expressionist dance, which has so much to do both with art and movement and form. And on the bottom, an area that I want to talk about later, which is uh, anti-Nazi and Holocaust remembrance materials, uh, por artist portfolios of this type. This is the 1931 prospectus, academic prospectus for the Bauhaus in Dessau. I'd never had this catalog before. I've had a few of the other uh, Lehrplans. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in great shape, um, but it is actually quite scarce. And when you think about the, the impact of the Bauhaus, which we all know about, on the modernity, modern art, and, and, and you hear who the teachers were, Feiniger, Gropius, Kandinsky, Clay, Hanna, Meyer, Moholy, Schlemmer, Albers, Bayer, Breuer, Schepper, Schmidt, and Stolz, it's, uh, it's just mind-boggling, right? I mean, earlier, of course, you had Paul Klee and Kandinsky as well, but it's the impact on modernity, it's just, uh, it's just astounding. And it's a real honor to actually have some of the things that we have in possession now. An example of 
the Bauhaus in its, in its people taking their work and putting it to work is this Bruder Lockhart uh, catalog and beautifully printed and laid out. It's printed in gravure which really allows for the contrast. You have these highly modernist designs, but I want to get to one page in particular in a second. Um, the buildings are just spectacular. You have some of the ideas, you see the circular no notion of like the ship forms or things that Neutra later would deal with also in, in California. But it's just, it's just, I think, just unbelievable. I mean, the, the production value in this catalog is just fabulous. I mean, look at that. It's just startling. Also quite scarce. So another really rare piece in addition to the catalog and the Bruder Lockhart catalog, is this uh, one issue from Buch and, and Werbekunst that was devoted specifically to the Bauhaus. And just initially, I mean, you can actually see, hopefully the camera will catch it, that the silver is all overprinted. It's the cover is incredibly uh, complicated design from Jos Schmidt. Um, it's got these, you know, just great patterns. Internally, in addition to things like uh, Moholy photograms and Annalisa Albers weaving carpets, extraordinarily unusual architectonische designs. And then at the back, it's got uh, just a spectacular piece. A portfolio of decorative ironwork, Art Nouveau ironwork, Art Nouveau designs. And then next to it is a is a Emile Segui portfolio called Samarkand. I usually have had things like prisms. Of course, Segui today is really over the top. The decorators love him for his butterflies and the insects, and they're selling for just huge amounts of prices, the ones that are being broken. They're often now being broken and, and uh, framed up for decorative purposes. The, the butterflies in particular, they're getting maybe a $1,000 a plate for them. It's pretty hard to believe. But anyway, he's, Segui was a master of pochoir. So I just want to mention for a little bit Albert Renger Potch. So again, most of you are familiar with who, who he, he was. Uh, but he was a, truly a revolutionary photographer, considered to be uh, the progenitor in photography of the Neue Sachlichkeit, the new reality movement in, in, uh, in, in art. And I'm going to just pick out from his, so the three books I have here that I'm showing uh, is, is uh, his uh, Hamburg, where he did, actually did a, a survey of the city, and, and underneath uh, has a very interestingly designed cover, but you rarely find it in the dust jacket. Eisen and Stahl, which here is without its paper wrapper, is his important work on uh, modernism as you look at, at industrial forms in a mod with a modern eye, things that we take for granted today, but in his day were really revolutionary. And I'm going to show an example from the Welte Schoen, which was a survey of his, of his nature photography, his portraiture, his architectural photography, and, and, his, uh, and his industrial photography. So this is uh, the Welte Schoen. This is uh, one in the first section where he's dealing with his nature work. Uh, you have to remember this is now 1928. It's it's the it's a year before Blosfeld's uh, Urformen was uh, was released. Of course, Blosfeld's work was absolutely revolutionary in terms of his close-up photography and his relationship of, of plant forms to artistic forms, and uh, and and it's just gorgeous to see. Whereas Renger's is is again uh, different. I mean, but his 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 view, his eye is entirely different from others who are taking these types of photographs at the same time. It's just even the way he did his advertising photos, the way he captures the textiles. This is actually the picture I wanted to show you is where? <laughs> this one. So something like this image, it's, it's really art photography, of course, but it's also dealing with uh, the change of the times, the idea of capitalism, the, but the metal forms are just so unusual. Another thing that's interesting about Renger is that all of his books were published on glossy paper. This is in contrast to gravure printing, which was the popular mode 
for presenting and the soft and the and the and the textured popular mode of most photographers at this time photographic works. Now this work, which is actually later, Abaceta, this incredibly powerful work that was done by Tame, it's a Czech photographer. It was it was a lot of the images were captured with a pinhole camera while he was in in in, in Ketset, but such incredibly emotional image. And this, and you see the, the the deep deep blacks from the gravure, which of course you can't capture in the in in the other style of printing. There's a, there's a texture and a softness, a, a, a romanticism, a three dimensionality that comes in this sense. So this is to me. This is now actually done in 1944. But in, in in and at the same time, I want to show you another example. I'm coming over this side. Eric Mendelssohn's mono, major monograph, important work, his work America, where he came and he, he, he gathered photographs of American skyscrapers. He wanted to show again the, the new architectural style, not Bauhaus, but, but basically he really wanted to show the, the architectural style of the, of the skyscrapers. And this book is also published in gravure. So it's on, it's on like a glossy paper, but in fact, the Prints are printed in gravure, and it's and again it has a it has a, look at the contrasts that they're able to get, you know, in this type of printing mode. And I've just I've always I've always been att attracted to to these these styles, you know, of sh of showing the uh, the architectural forms in particular. So I wanted to mention a couple unusual things as well. So th this work. Of uh, Maholinage's photographs was published in 1930. Franz Roll was the editor. Um, it's, it's called like 60 Photos. It was part of a series, a planned series of multiple volumes. Only two were ever published. The other one was for Annie Bierman. Uh, sometimes you'll actually see it with a wraparound uh, um, Buchbinder that is is here not present. It's a, it have been an advertising brochure. The work itself is is a great retrospective of Moholy's work. You have photograms, you have his you have his photo montages, you have his portraiture. It's uh, it's really quite special. It, and uh, for and then the Bauhaus is basically in 1933 the Nazis shut it down, uh, and people begin to go out into exile. By 1937, uh, Moholy uh, emigrates from Germany under pressure and comes to America. And in 1939, he starts over, as it were, anew with the School of Design in Chicago. So this is, the, is, is an early prospectus with the Lehrplan, with the program of what students would have in Chicago in, the, in the, what effectively was called the New Bauhaus. And uh, this catalog, which uh, shows his great influence, for example, at an internal page, this is totally, totally influenced by Mohali's uh, photo montage and idea of just sort of hum humor in, in graphics as well. And we also have, uh, in addition to like an invitation to the first graduating class, a brochure for a summer session, which is really quite special too. Probably this would have been 1940, 41, the beginning of the war. And this one has actually been modified to change the dates, little paste-ons on the back. And again, it has the classes the teachers who would be teaching and for the new for the whole new program of Bauhaus in America the Bauhaus in America so about 10 years ago I received a phone call from the son-in-law of uh, a man whose name was Plocher and I was really uh, it turned out to be something that was very fortuitous for me and also for the family and uh, he told me that uh, his father-in-law had been a designer in Los Angeles for many years and uh, invited me to a part of town that I hadn't been in in a long time and in a somewhat rundown house I found the workshop uh, of a really great artist in, in, and a creator of the forms and so for example Plocher everything that he did he, he worked in color theory and um, this is an example of one of his color cards it's number 789. So Plocher actually was a, was living in LA. He emigrated to the States in the 30s and was married an LA girl, was living here. 
Uh, he lived in Los Angeles. He was a, a craftsman and an artist. I found out later that he actually was someone who I was influenced by, uh, even secondhand as it were, throughout my youth. Uh, the example with that would be that uh, the color patterns that were used at all of the Walt Disney uh, installations like Disneyland were based on his concept and understanding of color. That the peacock on NBC television that we saw when we finally went, I'm old enough to remember this, from black and white to color television, and you had the color peacock for the first time, it was Plocher's system of color design that it was based upon. So Plocher had died, the son-in-law had inherited all of the material with, with, his, with his wife, and he said, can you help us you know, figure out a way to actually sell the remnants of our father's uh, estate? So I came out and looked, and it was like, wow, a whole new world opened up for me. I, I, I've always loved color. Who doesn't love color? But I didn't really have sort of any introduction to color theory. So it turned out that Plocher had emigrated in around 1939 from Germany. He'd been a, a student of Paul Baumann. Baumann had been, in the 20s, the great opponent of Ostwald. And they had, been, they had fought over concepts of color theory and systems uh, at the time, uh, Oswald at one time was involved with the Neue Werkkunst, and then he was then he was forced out, and Bauman's system was uh, superseded him. In any case, um, so I I have here both Plocher, which I'm going to show you in a moment, and I also have Bauman. I recently bought for the first time a complete set of the Bauman passes. So so anyway, so Bauman, like like Oswald, created a color circle, and uh, and and with uh, Otto Faza. Uh, a system for thinking of how you would look at color um, in, in, in non-chemically but visually and, and distinguish them. So they created, we think of paint chips, right, but they created, both of them, uh, Plocher and Bauman, created their own screen printed, this is Plocher, this is Bauman, screen printed samples of each color. So they both have a system with 1,365 colors, so Plocher basically built on Bauman when he came to America, and they're both numbered on the back, and so people would order still today their colors for, for uh, renovations based on these two systems. When I was always impressed by the Plocher screen printed, he screen printed all of his samples in all of his file books, and he used to have notebooks of this type, but when I actually bought the Bauman set, and I saw the quality of the printing, I was just like completely blown away. It's, it is so rich, it's so deep, and it's like the difference, really the difference between German formatting, uh, 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 printing at the time, and American printing at the time. So this is, this is the Bauman box, boxes, there are four boxes with colors in them. And then behind, hidden in here is the, is the, uh, the Plocher set. But I, I just truly, truly love them, and it opened up endless doors for me in thinking about textile design, color, art, just, just love it. So I really love, um, obviously who wouldn't love the typography on the cover of this uh, special Sonderausgabe that was done, Sonderheft, a special edition that was done honoring Peter Behrens uh, in 1902 for his uh, building homes and interior designs, the details of his 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 sensitivity of the turn of the century and the his type his type his typography and uh, it's just it's just it's just astounding. I mean, it just I don't know what else to say. It just it's great. Above it is one of the two major monographs that covers Barron's work. That's later. It's really, this monograph covers the period from 1909 to 1928 where he did more industrial work and larger commercial projects. So let's just start briefly with the caricature. So there's a fun piece, I mean, it's to say, call this a fun, that's the way I speak. So this is produced in Holland in 1944, directly, uh, immediately after the liberation of Holland, and it's a anti-Nazi ABC. So it's basically, a, it's caricatures. And the, the work itself is really, I think it's just great. I mean, it captures this whole feeling of, it shows you people being oppressed. It also shows the Nazis being kicked in the ass as well. And it's, it's really, uh, 
as you can see in, in the beginning, Goering and Hitler and, and uh, Goebbels are all in the, in the, in the stocks on the cover. So that's, that's an example of one piece. Then here is a collection, complete collection, including the, the envelope of 20 uh, poster postcards. So these were all, these are postcards, they're screen printed, each one's original screen print, that's based on a full-size poster that were all developed during the Spanish Civil War uh, in support of the leftists, anti-Franco, anti-fascist material. And uh, the set itself is uh, somewhat scarce, but it's especially scarce in, I have it with the envelope that we also have uh, here. Another anti-fascist piece is Helio Gomez's uh, Viva October, which also is about the Spanish Civil War. And the, you can see the incredible, fabulous block printing, very powerful social realism, proletarian work. From here I want to go to the next shelf, which deals with something that I really love. It's called Ausdruckstanz, Expressionist Dance. And you can see in this cover actually is uh, designed by Ludwig Holwein, the famous poster artist. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Holwein himself uh, actually was a supporter of the Nazi party. Uh, and he worked all the way, this is pre, this is 30s, but, the, but he, he continued to work and propagandized in his, in his art form for Nazi publications, for sports publications, and throughout, throughout the war. But in this case, the book, it, so the title is uh, uh, Uber Corpora und Seele der Frau, under the, under the body and the, and the spirit of the woman. And we have uh, examples of what I would call sort of artistic, artistic photography that shows how a dance form and an art form are similar, especially, especially in, the, um, in the, uh, the lower picture here with the shadows. And the, This is someone like Gerhard Riebeke also took photos of this type. Another example of the same thing, this is also a Holwein cover uh, from sport to art. And we have, um, again, this sort of artistic dance form. Oh, here we go. This we have men this time. And I've always been attracted to this to this period of dance and and, and uh, movement. So there's an area of artwork uh, that came out after World War II that, as part of my whole interest in Jewish life and the Holocaust, I began to collect. Uh, and these were artists' portfolios and uh, artists' illustrated works of survivors of the Holocaust. So, for example, uh, so the works began as early as 1945-46 to be published with illustrations, often with crude woodcuts or offset uh, woodcuts, and then um, the, a large number of material began to be produced in France between, let's say, 47 and 1955, and even until 1960. And then material was published in Czechoslovakia, people, uh, less, and uh, material was published in Hungary, woodblock printing, for example. Um, and in Poland, a number of Yiddish books were, were illustrated by survivors uh, that would have uh, less expressive like I'm going to show you illustrations, but still they were illustrated by Jewish surviving artists. So the first thing I'm just going to show you is a, a work that was done in France, and the title of the work is Buchenwald. Um, simple, simple portfolio cover, and just I wanted to show you a couple examples. It was done in uh, 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 500 copies with a second suite, which this one has, and so here you end up having a, uh, a lithographic uh, representation of life in the barracks, for example, or here, calling sto breaking stones, and then the workers pulling carts full of stones with a barbed wire in the background. Um, there are many, many French such portfolios. So that's done with original lith lithography. This is a, a Bratislava, uh, so it's called Czechoslovakian, even though the text is in is in uh, German. 
or by Macht Frey, the famous phrase. The cover actually is a screen print, um, but internally it's all done in photomechanical. So the, he had, of course, the artist had, had done all of these uh, illustrations in charcoal or in drawings, but they reproduced them in this glossy format. I've never seen the originals exhibited. I'm sure they, I believe they still exist, obviously. And then uh, just the third one I want to show you is this piece. So this Stanislav uh, Togo was a Polish uh, artist who was in, the, in in camps and then he was later moved to Germany and while he was in Hamburg uh, the camp, uh, DP camp that he was in, the Commandant actually found his work very compelling and they published two portfolios, Hitler Furiosa and Hitler Macabre. So the work is done in offset color lithography, but his work is absolutely striking. I'm not going to actually show you some of the really terrible ones because they're they're terrible in what they depict. But here you've got you know Himmler with an axe, blood all over himself in the background. I don't know if you can see people are hanging from the gallows. There's piles of chopped off heads on the side. Or in this image, the SS officer who of course is the, the epitome of evil the way he looks is holding the woman's hair and in the shadow is the hanging figure of theoretically her husband or someone who's close to her and he's pointing at it with a you know gleefully pointing this out to her that the person is dead. In Hitler Furioso they're more caricatured uh, of general life and not as uh, strong strongly um, anti-Nazi per se, although of course it's not, nothing, none of his work is going to be pro-Nazi. But this, this portfolio is actually quite scarce and it took me, uh, took me some years to, to find an, another set um, beyond the one that I own myself and have sold once or twice to private clients. So this, this portfolio is more of the, of the overt caricatures, uh, but I think his work is just great. This, I think it's really, really great. So this is a genre, like I said, that, I've, that I collect myself. Uh, I, I had a collection which went to Clark University with my Holocaust collection many years ago um, that they purchased. But, and that collection was about two, two feet of portfolios. And in the last years, I've begun collecting this material again and uh, have been able to find new things that I didn't have before as well as um, many of the things like this that I, that I do possess, and this which I possess, and this which I possess. So it's an area that I collect in, and I think it's, it's, it's uh, worth, worthy of your institutions to collect as well. So I think I would be uh, uh, amiss if I didn't uh, mention this really scarce and special portfolio uh, that was uh, created under the aegis of the uh, American Museum of Natural History in 1941 uh, through the camera work of the abstract expressionist artist David Hare. Um, so he was known in the New York scene and he was actually commissioned he would, uh, to do a photographic work. Somewhat in my own mind I was thinking about it a little bit like WPA photography of the time, although he wasn't a WPA photographer. So he came to New Mexico on commission from the museum to document the people of the um, Pueblos. So in the end, they actually, he photographed, he took 20 photographs, the portfolio was one of 100 copies, and he went through 15 of the 20 uh, Pueblos in New Mexico and found people who were willing to actually pose for him in portraiture. Um, there's text inside, of course, that helps to identify the, the individuals and uh, where they were. And it's, we're in 1941 in America. Uh, you know, there was no electricity in most of these places and living very simply. Um, but the people have great, as you can see, they look fabulous and, and were photographed in the way that they wanted to be captured in their regular costume. The men are actually often in like a lot of Western clothing, whereas the 
the women, although we have a you know Indian motif, although the women uh, have uh, more what you'd think of as native patterns, although not here necessarily here they're making pottery, but it's just I think it's just a, a great portfolio and um, when I had the chance to acquire it, I did. So I hope one day you'll have a chance to look at it too. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I really sincerely appreciate that you took the time to, to listen to me. I hope that some of what I had to say might have been new for you, and that if not, at least I was entertaining and my enthusiasm for the material, which I truly have, was contagious so that you'll go back to your own institutions, libraries, and find some of the same material on the shelves and take a look at it in person. All of the material that we talked about is on our website. If, image, if the books don't have images, it's because we recently bought them and we haven't been keeping up with photography. But we're happy to send you images if you're interested. You'll see that an email that we sent to all the attendees is also available there that has a coupon on it if you're at all interested in pursuing any of what we were uh, talking about or other stuff. We have you know over 16,000 books on our website and probably uh, a third of them at least are in the, in the arts in one form or another. Again, I want to thank you so much. I really miss not having seen you in person, and next year we really look forward to meeting again at the Arliss Conference. Thank you so much. Bye.